it is great to see you back tonight. And I've got a question as we get started. How honest are you feeling tonight? Decent? Marginal? Enough to be in church? Maybe not enough to lead in prayer? Something like that? All right, well, whatever level of honesty you have, I want you to direct it towards several personal questions. And by the way, do not feel the need to raise your hand if any of these pertain to you. But if it hits close to home, feel free to smile at me. It's always better when people are smiling at you. So here's the first question. Within the last few weeks, has God convicted you of your attitude, your responses, or your demeanor with others? <laughs> <laughs> we hadn't even gotten out the gate good. And there's a lot of people smiling at me. Uh, second question. In the last few weeks, have you noticed that you might have a tendency to lash out first and then go back and find out the facts? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Number three. In general, have people learned to steer clear of you if you don't get your way? Mm. Number four. Are the words warpath foul, or rather unpleasant, at least semi-occasionally connected to your name. And number five, have you rolled your eyes at any of the questions that I've just asked you? <laughs> All right. So I'm not sure if the smile test is the most effective testing method. Uh, you all are either really, really guilty or you really love being in church. But chances are most of us can at least identify with some of those particular questions at particular points in our life and for some people uh, their mood their mindset their feelings they're just kind of out there for everyone to see if it's going on in their mind then pretty much everybody around them knows what's happening really no surprises then other people do a great volcano impression and what I mean by that is they suppress their feelings. They suppress their emotions. They put a cap on top of their concerns. Everything is just kind of boiling and stirring and rumbling under the surface. And then all it takes is one person smirking when they should have smiled. And they explode. They erupt on that person. And I mean, in that moment, it's difficult because literally like small children are scrambling under coffee tables in order to get away from things and veins are bulging in their neck. And it's, it's not pretty. It's a difficult moment for them and everybody else that's involved. So while people might not be able to see every part of our character, there's a really good chance they see a whole lot of our responses the question becomes, what do they actually see? When we're wronged, do we lash out? When offended, do we jump to conclusions? When stressed, do we operate in gentleness? Do we operate with patience? When we're blessed, do we walk with pride or do we walk in humility? When people look at our lives... What are they seeing? What are the responses? What are the attitudes? What are the actions? What are the pieces flowing out of our character? All of that sets up our big truth that's not only for tonight, but also for the next time we meet. Here it is. Our character informs our responses. That's the first part of this big truth. Our character informs our responses. That means it leads into our responses. It helps determine our responses. What happens at a character level also informs what's going on on our responses. But our responses impact our quality of life, the opportunities we're given, and the relationships that we enjoy. There's a lot of our life that is impacted by the way we respond to others. So as we move into this application section of the book of Ephesians, the Apostle Paul describes characteristics of a worthy walk. And after three chapters describing our position and our possessions in Christ, now it's time to live it out. Now it's time to take those steps of application. And the first step that the Apostle Paul is taking in application is he brings us back to the character of Christ and also how we respond in real-world scenarios. And that's what the next several chapters are going to be about. 
And this is important. This is huge. That is, Christianity happens in real-world scenarios. Christianity is not some theoretical thing that we just sit about and we talk about in church, but rather it is unbelievably practical. It's lived out in the daily spheres and influences of our life. We'll find that our responses many times to others that are flowing out of character, how we act, what we do, it will impact so many parts of our life. Now, let's just pause here for just a moment. There are people who they will go from drama to problems, from problems to friction, from friction to fallout. And all along the way, they're wondering, why is this happening? And so often it's happening because of their responses in that moment. Many times they treat people abrasively. They treat them with contempt, hurtfully, pridefully, impatiently. And as a result of that, people don't know how to respond sometimes around them. And what happens is in those cases, people begin to pull back. People do not allow them in as close. And as a result of that, the people many times feel like their relationships are suffering. They're not given the opportunities that they would like to have. Sometimes they, they feel as though everybody's against them, but the issue is sometimes people simply don't know how to respond. So tonight, this is an unbelievably practical message. What I mean by that is part of the message drives us back to the fact that Christianity has to be God living it through us. But there's another part of this, and that is Paul is going to challenge believers that how we interact with others, what flows out of our character, is going to many times determine the depth of relationships. It's going to determine the quality of our life, the opportunities. All of those things begin to flow out of character. So tonight, we got a lot to cover. I'm going to invite you, if you're not already there, go with me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter number 4. We'll be in verses 1 through 3. I am speaking tonight on the subject of characteristics of a worthy walk. Now remember, he is setting things up in these first couple of verses, but you're going to find that he's going to take these same principles and he's going to drop them into the church. He's going to drop them into marriage. He's going to drop them into your prayer life. He's going to drop them into how you relate to others. He takes the same pieces and he keeps working them out in different circles of influence. So here's what it says, verse 1 and following. Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we get into the text, may your Spirit guide us, help us to see exactly where you are are honing this in for each of us. In Jesus' name, amen. We need to have immediate caution when we begin to read verses 1 through 3. And I say immediate caution because if you read those three verses and your first thought is the Apostle Paul has a really good point, I need to start doing those things. I need to be more patient. I need to be more gentle. I need to be more humble. And in fact, I'm so bothered by this, I'm going to start tomorrow. If that's the path we begin on, we're already on the wrong path. Everything that he's describing flows out of only what God can do in and through our lives. These are not truths that you and I look at, and in the best of our ability, we try to live them out. Remember, the commands of God are written to the life of Christ in you. It is important for us to look back at the very first word that we find in verse number one. It's the word, therefore. Therefore indicates to us that what is about to be shared is based upon something that was just shared a few moments ago that the information we're about to receive is a continuation of what was just given. So we need to back up for just a moment. We found at the end of chapter 3 
that it has to be God who is the one living his life through us. So the question for us, even right now, would be, can any of us live the Christian life through our own abilities and through our best efforts? No, absolutely not. So if you and I cannot live the Christian life, then why would he say that you are to walk in a manner worthy of this calling? Is he telling us to do something that you and I do not have the capacity, the ability to actually do? Actually, no, because if you look back in chapter 3, verse 20, he says, Now to him who's able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us, who can do abundantly more than we ask or think? God can. What's the source of the power that is within us? It's God's power. In fact, in chapter 3, verse 16, he says that we are strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. So the power that we need to walk in a worthy manner, it is not our power. The ability to do this is not our ability, it is God's. The question now becomes, how do we tap into that power? How do we step into that enablement that can only come from God? That's actually where we ended in chapter 3. Here was the principle that we learned. Submission precedes transformation. Submission to God precedes transformation by God. Our job is to stay in a submitted position. God's part will bring transformation through us. If submission to God is not firmly entrenched in our minds. Don't take this the wrong way, but we probably need to go home now and not even get into what he's going to describe in chapters 4 through 6. Everything he's describing is predicated upon us understanding submission, us understanding it's not us doing it for God, it's God doing it through us. Submission precedes transformation. So let's pause and let's kind of work this out in an illustration that hopefully is going to make sense to a lot of people. Let's say you find out that a Christian friend of yours has been spreading rumors about you. And they're hurtful rumors. It, it's caused people to talk. And then whenever it came back to you, you were bothered by it. In fact, your, your first response is you want to go to that person in front of everybody and you want to challenge them and you want them to, to know without a doubt that what they said was wrong. And in your heart, you're like, I want to confront them because people need to hear the truth. I'm not afraid about what's going to come out. But then you remember that principle we just talked about. Submission to God precedes transformation by God. And this thought comes to mind. I probably need to submit to God. At least take this to God in prayer. So you go to God in prayer and you say, God, I'm mad with this person. I'm upset. I feel like what they did was wrong. God, I'm submitting myself to you right now. Would you help me know what I need to do? And in prayer, God guides you to Matthew 18. And it says, if your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you've won your brother. And you read that and you think, wow, that is very applicable to what I'm walking through. Not nearly as fun as open confrontation, but it's very clear God is saying this is what he wants me to do in this situation. Now, if you're in that moment, you now have a decision to make. Do you do what you want to do in the flesh or do you submit to God and do what you know he has told you to do? Go to that person in private. Now, if you choose that path, just know that is one step of submission of which many problems have multiple steps of submission involved. For example, in that one scenario, you have to submit your frustration to God. Otherwise, you're going to wig out on somebody. You have to submit your responses to God. You have to submit your need to feel justified to God. You have to submit your will before God. You have to submit your next steps and your actions before God. Multiple steps of submission that are found in one single problem. Now, let's say you do all of that, and that person just starts more rumors about you. 
What if, what if you do all of that? And they get so mad, they cut you out of their life. What are you supposed to do at that point? I've got a real good little piece of information for you. Victory is in obedience, not outcome. God is not holding you accountable for how they respond. He's holding you accountable for how you respond. We also need to understand that when we obey God, when we submit to him, it does not mean everything is going to be calm and everything is going to be comfortable. In fact, Jesus obeyed the Father and it led him to the cross. Stephen spoke the truth and he still got stoned for it. Paul was faithful in his ministry and yet it cost him his very head. Obedience does not mean everything will be calm and comfortable in our life. But obedience is necessary for a life of submission to God. Submission to God, think of it like this. Submission to God is the ongoing process of you getting out of the driver's seat so that God can take the wheel of your life. That's what submission looks like. It's God, I don't trust myself to drive in these circumstances. I don't trust that I'm going to do the right thing. So, Lord, I submit to you, and I, as best I know how, I slide out of that driver's seat so that you are at the wheel in my life. When that happens, you begin to see God do things that you and I would not normally do. In fact, that is everything we're going to find in chapters 4 through 6 is it is painting a picture of what it looks like when God is at the wheel of our life. Paul shows what it looks like when God is driving our responses, when he's driving our churches, when he is driving our minds, when he is dictating what comes out of our mouths, when he is at the helm of our emotions. We see what it looks like when God is the one directing our marriages and our families and he is working things out within our relationships. We see what it looks like when God is the one directing our prayers and even directing our efforts in service for him. We see over the next three chapters, this is what it looks like when God is living these principles out through us. When God lives through us, there's going to be five character-based responses that will define our daily walk. Humility, gentleness, patience, tolerance, and unity. So I want you, if you would, Look back at verse number one. It says, therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord. Now let's stop right there for a moment. He mentions his circumstances in the same breath that he mentions our responses. Why is that important? Because a lot of times people feel like their responses will be better when their circumstances get better. That is rarely the case. If you'll remember, Paul is writing these words from prison. That's not exactly ideal circumstances. Even though he is in prison, he is not acting like a normal prisoner. His responses, his actions, his demeanor is different than what a prisoner might be. He encouraged people instead of waiting for others to encourage him. He treated others well even when they treated him disrespectfully. From prison, He's reminding other believers, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. He told believers in Philippi, I know how to get along with humble means and how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, of having abundance and suffering need. Here's the thing I want you to see. Paul's circumstances did not determine his value, his joy, his contentment, nor his responses. He is still operating well even under difficult circumstances. So last week, we talked about this word walk. Walk is to be our habitual way of living. Worthy is another word that we talked about last week. It speaks of a balanced scale. What's on one side of the scale should balance what's on the other side. Our daily life, our responses and our actions should balance our spiritual position in Christ. 
So when we are walking in a worthy manner, in a Christ-like manner, what are those characteristics that are going to be lived through our life? Here's the first that we cover tonight. We only cover the first two. We live in humility. We live in humility. Humility means to think or to judge with lowliness. It's to have a lowliness of mind. John Wesley actually wrote, quote, neither the Romans nor the Greeks had a word for humility. In fact, that concept was considered to be so abhorrent, so foreign to that culture, there wasn't even a word that was available to describe it. So as best we can tell, the Greek word for humility was actually coined by Christians as they're trying to describe a quality with which there's no other word in that language to define it. It is fitting that humility is the first attitude or response because it is foundational to the Christian life. Listen to the way one commentator said it. Quote, humility is an ingredient of all spiritual blessing. Just as every sin has its roots in pride, every virtue has its roots in humility. Humility allows us to see ourselves as we are because we see ourselves before God as he is. Just as pride is behind every conflict that we have with other people and every problem with fellowship that we have with the Lord, so humility is behind every harmonious human interaction, every spiritual success, and every moment of joyous fellowship we have with the Lord. End of quote. Did you hear everything he just said? The position of humility not only positions us in a right place before God, it also positions us in a right place before others. When humility is there, it positions us in a way in which God can most effectively live through us. We find also Philippians 2 tells us Jesus is the one who led the way in humility. It says he emptied himself, taking on the form of a bondservant, and humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. We find that Proverbs chapter 15, verse 33, Solomon taught, before honor comes humility. The apostle Paul told believers in Philippi, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in humility let each esteem others better than themselves. When God is at the steering wheel of our life, when he's the one controlling our life, when we are living submitted before God, he will live humility through us. Here's the next piece. We act with gentleness. Humility produces gentleness. Now, some of your Bible translations use the word meekness here. That's probably a much better translation for this word. The word this translated as gentleness or meekness. It refers to that which is mild-spirited, self-controlled, the opposite of vindictive and vengeful. Meekness is power that is under control. The Bible speaks of several key people, several key characters that are defined in terms of meekness or gentleness. Uh, David displayed meekness when he refused to king kill or he refused to kill King Saul as they were in the caves outside of En Gedi. Moses is described as a man who was humble and meek. Jesus described himself as gentle and lowly in heart. This is one of those times when a Webster's Dictionary will mess you up if you're trying to understand a biblical concept. And by the way, it's not just now, it's most of the time a Webster's Dictionary will mess you up. There is a Bible dictionary, and then there's an English like Webster's dictionary. And those terms are often not the same thing. So, for example, many dictionaries will define the term meekness as timid or deficient of courage or spirit. That is not a biblical understanding of meekness. Biblical meekness was used of wild animals that are now under control. The animal still had its spirit and its strength, but its will was now under the control of the master. A lion might be tamed, 
but it's powerful. It has strength and ability, but that power is now under the control of the trainer. A racehorse is still extremely fast, but the speed and the direction of the horse is now under the control of the rider. That's how the Bible talks about this idea of meekness. It is power that is under control. For the Christian to live a meek life, it does not mean they become a doormat for everyone. You need to hear this. It means that their strengths and their weaknesses, their gifts and their ambitions, their attitudes and their behaviors, their plans and their will, they have been submitted to God and he's the one who controls their responses. He's the one who says, now's the time to go. Now is what you need to do. This is what you need to say. This is how you need to respond. It does not mean that they become a doormat. It means that power is now under control. One of the greatest biblical illustrations of meekness was actually found in the Garden of Gethsemane. If you'll remember in the story, the soldiers came to arrest Jesus. Peter pulls a sword. He cuts off the ear of a servant. And as soon as it happens, Jesus heals the man's ear. And here's what he says. Put your sword back in its place. Or do you not think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? He's basically wanting them to understand he's capable of defending himself. He's capable of acquiring assistance if that's what he needs. He's God. All he had to do is give the word. All he had to do is say now. And he could have annihilated every single one of those soldiers. He could have wiped out the entire Roman government. He could have wiped out all of those religious haters. All he had to do is say the word and it would have happened. And yet, in that moment, he submitted himself to the will of the Father. That type of submission is a beautiful picture of meekness. He is still 100% God, still 100% capable, still 100% has ability and power, and yet he chose a path of submission. He lived that way before the Father, and he wants us to live that way before him. When we submit to God the Father, here's what's going to happen. We don't say everything that we want to say because it's not what he would have us to say. It means that we don't just unload on somebody because we're upset. It means that we don't just act any way we want and then say, but that's just my personality. As a child of God, that's not okay. We understand three chapters he's been saying, this is how you can live above the problems, the circumstances, the issues that you're facing. But for you to live there, it's not about you saying, now I know that, I'll go do it. No, now I know that, and I understand the importance of continually submitting myself before God. If we follow that one piece, how many fights would come to an end how many relationships could be healed how many jobs would people keep how many more opportunities would we possibly have how much more stress could be alleviated from our life and by the way it takes energy to stay that mad with people Stressed out the whole time, that's, that's hard work. Being stressed out is a full-time job that you don't get paid at, and there's no benefit involved in it. It's not worth it. And hey, while we're here, before we finish this message, just know, when we're still in the driver's seat of our own life, we instinctively look out for number one. We do not live the first and the second great commandment. Love God and love people. When God is the one who is at the driver's seat of our life, he begins to put those priorities 
as our priorities. We look out for what God desires. We care about what others are thinking, how they're going to feel, how they're going to respond. We're asking God, Lord, would you live this through me in the right way? So here's a couple of questions as we close out. What if the other person doesn't do the same thing to you? What if you respond that way and they don't respond the same way to you? That's not your concern. Their response will be something that they deal with before God. Your response is what you have to deal with before God. So what if I lose the fight? There's a really good chance you will. In fact, the further you walk with Jesus, the more you find that even if you think you won, did you really win if you had to dishonor him in the process? What if I can't do it? Congratulations. You are human like all the rest of us. That's the reason there's three chapters of. He has to be the one to do it. Submission to God precedes transformation by God. When God is the one driving our life, gentleness and meekness will be a couple of those characteristics that come through. So what do you do just on the first two? And we're just getting to two of these tonight. What do you do? How do you apply this particular truth into your daily walk? If you're to walk in a manner worthy of the calling, what does that look like? How do you apply this? I would say first, start with what would be considered pressing concerns. Everybody has certain issues in their life that they feel like God just keeps working on. He keeps bringing to their attention. It's, it's things that they're asking God to change. And your things might not be my things, and our things might not be somebody else's things, but we all got things. So here's what I would encourage you to do. Ask God, what are the pressing concerns in your life? It might be in your spiritual life. It might be in your marriage. It might be in your finances. It might be with your kids. It might be a part of attitude that every... Every so often you find God bringing that back up and saying, we need to deal with this. Whatever the pressing issues are, start there. Once you identify those, submit it to God. Recognizing that submission many times comes in multiple steps of submission for the exact same problem. So it's more than just saying, God, I submit this to you. And then you go right back out and you do whatever you want to do. Chances are you're going to submit it to God. And then there's going to be other things. He's like, nope, I need you to submit this too. I need you to submit this too. And all of a sudden you find yourself living in a state of submission. So start with the pressing concerns. Submit each one of those to God and pray that God lives his response through you. You and I cannot live those teachings. We cannot respond in full gentleness. We cannot respond in full patience. We cannot respond in full humility. That, it, that is outside of our ability to do. It is not outside of his ability. Submission precedes transformation. So here's the truth, big truth, one more time. Our character informs our responses. And our responses impact our quality of life, the opportunities we're given, and the relationships we enjoy. You're going to see that big truth worked out for three chapters in a row. He's going to take those five pieces we've covered, and he's going to drop them into all of these situations. And you're going to see that over and over again. Our character informs our responses, and our responses impact our quality of life the opportunities we're given, and the relationships we enjoy. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask, Lord, this evening that you would allow our hearts, our focus, our mind to continually be in a place of walking in submission to your desire to live in and through us. Lord, may we walk away from this message tonight, not in a position of defeat, but one of recognizing once again we have to walk in a position of submission. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Have a wonderful night. We'll see you back this next Friday for Good Friday service.